this video lecture. It's an auditing lecture and we'll be, I'll be taking you through substantive procedures. This is a two-part video recording and in this part we're going to look at part of what you should learn for the whole topic. Please make sure that you watch part two and the instructions that follow. What are our learning outcomes for this, for this session? We want to be able to define what substantive procedures are and just have an overview of the substantive procedures. We also want to be able to say so, when should substantive procedures be performed? When should one carry out substantive procedures? Why should you perform substantive procedures? And risk of material misstatement or risk assessment procedures, how do they fit in or the, how do they come together with substantive procedures? We also want to see how we should design substantive procedures. So that's what we want to learn for this lecture. Let's jump into the lecture and have an overview of where in the auditing process do substantive procedures come in. We are now at the evidence obtaining stage or evidence gathering stage. And there are basically two ways of obtaining audit evidence or gathering of audit evidence. Firstly, it's through test of controls and substantive procedures. We've got various standards, auditing standards, that cover substantive procedures. So generally your 500 series, 500 to 508, um, you've also got 600, 600, 610 and 620. They also come through as ways of obtaining substantive procedures. Our question comes and says, what are substantive procedures? So you find that as you are assessing your risk, you remember that we did risks at a session level. And it, now when you are obtaining evidence, we are saying that a substantive procedure is an auditing procedure which is designed to detect material misstatements at the accession level. So we are saying that your substantive procedures are going to address those risks that you would have identified at a session level. And so you find that there are two types of substantive procedures. We've got tests of detail. So these are testing the detail of the account balance or of the class of transaction. They are also testing detail of disclosures, if that's what you want to gather evidence about. Then we've got what is called the substantive analytical procedures. These will also explain them in part two of, this, uh, of the substantive procedures video lectures. One would ask, so now that I know what substantive procedures are, when should I perform them? So you find that substantive procedures should always be performed, irrespective of um, the risk that has been assessed. You still need to carry out your substantive procedures, especially on all or each and every balance that you have determined to be material, or each and every class of transaction that you have determined to be material. You need to carry out substantive procedures. So yes, you might carry out your test of controls, depending on the risk that you've assessed. You will still need to carry out your substantive procedures because it will then enable you to gather sufficient appropriate audit evidence. One would then say, why should we then perform substantive procedures? Now that I know what they are, now that I know um, when to perform them, how should you perform, uh, sorry, why should you perform your substantive procedures? So remember, when we did risk assessment, we said that the only element of audit risk that is in the control of the auditor is detection risk. So you need to carry out procedures or formulate procedures that are going to reduce detection risk so that overally you reduce your, uh, your audit risk. So in 
uh, why you perform substantive procedures? As we said, it's to reduce the detection risk to an acceptable level so, so that also you can obtain evidence to determine whether the amounts and disclosures in the financial statements are free from material misstatements. That is why you perform substantive procedures. How then do substantive procedures fit into risk assessment? Briefly in the past, I've been explaining to you uh, where exactly substantive procedures fit in after you've assessed risk. So you find that um, the auditor should actually perform risk assessment first. After performing your risk assessment procedures, you identify those risks of material misstatements. And the substantive procedures are actually going to be responding to those risks at a session level. You're asking yourself, what can possibly go wrong? You've got an account balance, let us say PPE, and you're saying, what can possibly go wrong? What is it that can hinder um, somebody for, from saying the financial statements or uh, the PPE within the financial statements pr is presented fairly in accordance with IA16, for example? So you ask yourself, what can go wrong? And that what can go wrong is the risk that um, is at a session level. So we're saying the auditor should actually then design further auditing procedures. And these further auditing procedures being your substantive procedures, which are then going to say, what is the nature of the procedure? What is its timing and the extent? So that you can respond to those risks that you'd have assessed at risk assessment phase. Let's see how then do we design our substantive procedures. We talked about nature in the previous slide. And by saying nature, we're saying what is the nature that we're going to use to detect material misstatements at a session level? It could be analytical procedures, for example. So when do I use this nature of analytical procedures? Or when do I use the nature of test of details? So you find that your analytical procedures tend to be used more when we've got voluminous transactions, where we've got large volumes, and we've got expected trends or predictable patterns over time. That is when you can use your analytical procedures. Then with your test of detail, so it's all assertions um, for material classes of transactions. That is when you actually then uh, use them in terms of the nature of, of procedure that you're going to carry out. And it's, it's for all um, account balances, for all classes of transactions, or for disclosures. And so with the test of details, as nature, you're saying, I am testing the actual detail. So for example, you can have an invoice and you're saying, how then do I use this? So you're testing the detail on the invoice. That is a test of detail. How much was it? How much is the invoice amount? Who is this invoiced to? What is the date of this invoice? What is the quantity of goods that were sold or that were purchased on this particular invoice? That is testing the detail. Again, when it comes to timing, now that we know the nature, let's go on to timing. So what does the, the timing in terms of substantive procedures refer to? You, you find that your timing speaks to when these procedures are going to be carried out. The period, at, uh, the period in which they're going to be performed. The period in which the substantive procedures actually uh, apply to or the evidence applies to. Then we move on to extent. Extent refers to the quantity. How much of this type of substantive procedure do we want to carry out? How much of the um, substantive analytical procedures do you want to, to perform? And how much of the test of details do we want to perform? And you find that the greater the risk of material misstatement, the greater the extent of substantive procedures. 
and it is also necessary to increase your extent of substantive procedures where, uh, let's say, tests of controls are not working effectively. That is when you need to carry out more substantive procedures. So this will then also speak to your materiality. What is the level of materiality that you set? If you set uh, a, a lower materiality, it means you will have more substantive procedures or more procedures to carry out. That also speaks to extent. If your risk was assessed to be high, then it also means that you will need to carry out more substantive procedures. That again speaks to the extent of substantive procedures that you're carrying out based on their nature. Okay. So there are types of substantive procedures, different types. When you're wording a substantive procedure, you then have to word it in a way that somebody knows what exactly they have to go and do. So for example, are they going to inspect? So if they're inspecting, inspecting consists of uh, examining of records at, or documents or a physical examination of an asset. That is an inspection. So your substantive procedure is through inspection. You will be inspecting, let's say for example, an invoice for the amount. You can also carry out inquiries. That is also another type of substantive procedures. And this consists of seeking for information from knowledgeable parties within or outside an organization. So you can, have, you can carry out inquiries uh, of management, inquire of management for something, or inquire of a third party, e.g. Law, their lawyers or the bankers, for certain information. That is uh, another type of substantive procedure. We've also got external confirmations. So this is uh, whereby the auditor examines information directly from an external party. And this is through a written response, through a third party. That could again be your lawyers, or that could again be um, your, your, um, your, your, your bankers speaking to in, in terms of uh, in terms of the client. So it could be in, it has to be written, but it could be in electronic form or a physical form, any other form of, um, of getting this uh, external confirmation. We've got recal recalculations, and just as the word says, it's uh, going through the mathematical calculation, redoing it, that's a recalculation. We've got our analytical procedures, as we talked about, which consist of um, information that has certain trends, pre-known trends or pre-known expectations. That is only when you can carry out substantive procedures. So for example, when you know that there's a relationship uh, between sales and your GP, when you know that there's a relationship between number of employees and the employee cost, that's a pre-known relationship. Or when you know that we've got certain trends of our sales, at this point in time, maybe based on whether we've got higher sales. So it's a trend that you can go and examine. It's a trend that you can go and test. Whether it's, it's uh, conforming to the expected. That's an analytical procedure. We've got our general procedures. These general procedures in, include things like uh, your review of minutes, obtaining management uh, representation letters, those are your general procedures. And all these types of substantive procedures, they work when you're trying to obtain uh, sufficient appropriate audit evidence. You then have to determine which one I will be using at which point in time. You might find that at, with some, uh, in terms of when you're trying to, to gather some form of evidence, you'll find that sometimes um, inquiries will be better. But sometimes you can then say, no, I want something that has actually got to be written. So you've got your external what? Confirmations. Sometimes you can then determine to say, no, but I might actually prefer to, to recalculate this. And so then you carry out a recalculation. Over and above actually inspecting, let's say, an invoice. You can actually recalculate the quantities, quantity times the unit price, and then you recalculate the total price. That's also a substantive procedure. So it is based on the auditor's judgment 
which type of procedure to carry out when and when. How then do you design a substantive procedure? This is for exam purposes. How best do you design a substantive procedure? You need to make sure that when you word your substantive procedure or when you've written it down, does it have the how? How are you going to be carrying it out? How is a doing word? It's a verb. So how is describing an action? I'm inspecting, I'm recalculating, I'm observing. That is how. And there are a number of ways of how you carry something out. When you've actually said how you're going to be doing it, which is the doing word, which is your verb, what? Which refers to the reliable source of evidence. What is it? Is it an invoice? Is it a process? An, a, a process that you're going to be, let's say, observing. So, for example, how? Observe what? A process. What process? Maybe employees signing in or clocking in and clocking out. How? Inspect. What? An invoice. But that's just not enough to say how am I doing it and what am I going to be doing it on. You also have to spell out why you're doing, why you're carrying out a certain procedure. That is the reason for the procedure. And normally it's with regards to the, to the assertion. You then have the assertion in mind to say, why am I doing this? Maybe because I want to confirm existence. So I'm actually going to go and inspect um, the, the invoices. And when I've inspected the invoices, why are you inspecting those invoices? Maybe to confirm valuation or to confirm the purchase price. So when you're confirming a purchase price, essentially the assertion that you're trying to confirm there is valuation. So that's how best you describe or you design a substantive procedure. Make sure you've got the how, you've got the what, and you've got the why. It does not necessarily mean that they have to be in the order of how, what, and why. It could be the what, and then how, and why. So that's how you describe a substantive procedure. This is our, the end of our part one. Look out for part two. Thank you.